I think we can start. Good afternoon, early evening everyone. Fantastic to welcome you here to the Carol Nash. I think it's the first time we've had a research forum in the Carol Nash for two years, I think. So we're aware that the screen behind us, for those who are joining us on YouTube and on Zoom, is not legible currently, but we are going to sort it. Okay. So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Denis Lin, who is our International Chair in Musicology. I think the second only, the second one ever. Um, I think the first was um, Charles Rosen, so he's in good, good footsteps. Um, and he's been with us since 2017, and he's um, delivered the International Research Lecture in 2017, and also the keynote at the Debussy uh, Conference Centenary Celebrations in 2018, and he's taken part in a number of conferences and events and research for uh, over the past few years. And he's worked with our students, so we really try very hard to involve um, live performance in, in the, the lectures that he, he gives here. Um, and it, we're really delighted that our, our students are, are performing some musical examples for the, this um, research forum. And then at 6.30, we've got a recital um, of the, 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 a number of repertoire, putting Zagon's music. Into, into context. So just a word or two about um, Daniel Lain, who is Director of Research at CNRS, um, Irimus in, in Paris, a very coveted position there, which is, uh, allows him to devote all his time to research, or almost all his time, when he's not in Manchester or in Metz or in other, other places. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful because he's also, he's a world-leading expert on, on Debussy, well re renowned, absolutely, and, and also on Couperin à Rameau, and to have that um, expertise in all of those areas is, is um, very impressive. And today he was talking to our doctoral students on Hamo. And today, it's, um, this evening, it's something very different. He's looking at the Hungarian composer Zagon and um, the, the, the work that Debussy did on looking at his composition. And we're going to hear a performance of Piero Luner by Zagon mm. and in the context of other Hungarian music of Bartok and Kodai, with whom he was closely associated. So I'm best to, to hand over to Denis, um, but before I do so, to alert you that we have a book launch. So Denis just published his writings, collected writings on Claude Debussy, and we have discounts <laughs> if you're watching us online or if you're watching us in, in person, if you're here. And uh, for students, it's, it's even better. It is in French, but um, I'm sure that that's, that won't be an impediment <laughs> to, to many of you, but it's fantastic to see this book, which has just literally appeared in the past month. Great, so please welcome Daniel Lang to give our research forum today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for coming here. And uh, very happy to do the uh, first uh, year, not in Zoom. It's uh, rather different, and uh, that's very important. And I would like also to thank um, David Jones and uh, Michaela Wagner and uh, Sasia Eck the musical example it's not so easy to do it uh, uh, like that to show the difference but it's very important i think you can uh, see exactly what you did on Zagon text and i also i also want to thank my uh for like hungarian colleague uh last of who was the first uh, to um mention uh, mention me this uh, uh, this uh, manuscript created by wc and also Bolga Clara Ilyesh, uh, who is at the head of the music department of the Sercheni Library, and uh, Peter Bozo, also a very good friend. And uh, it's important to have this link with uh, Hungarian uh, scholars. Thank you very much. So, uh, on 28 November 1910, Debussy left Paris and embarked upon a concert tour in the Austro Hungarian Empire. As usual, he was hardly enthusiastic about having to make such a trip. And yet, on 7 December, he returned to the capital with many fond memories of his stay in Budapest and of the warm reception he had received there, as um, indicated on that very day in a letter to Gustav Barti, one of the owners of the Roja Volvini publishing house and the man who had organized his tour. I quote Debussy. Here I am back in Paris, which despite the delights of Budapest, remain nonetheless a very charming tone. Even though I'm exhausted, I want to tell you right away how deep touched I was by your hospitality. 
it was exceedingly good of you to arrange matters in order that I be able to avoid the difficulties usually encountered by visitors to foreign countries who do not know the language. I also left on the piano the score of Estamp, in which you will also find my homage à Rameau. Will you please be so kind as to return these things along with the popular Hungarian music you promised to send along, and which I am very anxious to have. I believe that this represents just about everything that I've left behind." End quote. Indeed, on 5 December, in the concert hall of the Vigado, a hall that resembled a Turkish bass as the composer put it, Debussy had played the Children's Corner, Fagod, Hommage à Rameau, and Jardin sous la pluie, and he had accompanied uh, Rose Ferrer in the first book of Fred Galland, Ingrid, the fifth of the Aria Publié, and in the two Proderic, The Soir and The Fleur. The Balbo Kertoli Quartet also gave what Debussy described as an especially remarkable performance of his quartet. Ten days later, on 19 December, Debussy again sang Bartzi, this time for having sent him the Hungarian music, and added, at the end of his letter, I quote Debussy, I have also received the music of our friend Guillaume Zagon, which you may be sure I will attend to shortly. He is a very pleasant fellow and is full of promise. Until recently, end quote, until recently, it was not known which work Gezavin Mosh Zagon has sent to Debussy and in what sense Debussy was to attend to it. It was only at the time of the exhibition of Gezar Vilmos Sagon in Paris, 1912-1940, which ran at the Cheshini National Library of Budapest in spring 2013, that it became apparent first that the work in question was the autographed manuscript of Pierrot Luner, Zagon's setting of six poems from the collection by Albert Giraud, and second, that what Debussy was to attend to as we know from the correction in his hand, was the setting of the text in this composition for voice and piano. At the conclusion of the exhibition, Bogartar Iliesh, curator of the Sechini National Library, published an important article on the visit that Zagon made to Paris from 1912 to 1940 in Studia Musicologica. The autograph manuscript of the Zagon Pierre Lunaire is a truly unique document for to the best of all knowledge, there is no other such evidence of Debussy having revised the work of a younger com contemporary. But before turning our attention to the revision made by the composer of Peleas and Elisande, let us briefly to outline the promises career of Zagon, who died prematurely at the end of the First World War at the age of 29, uh, 29 and to attempt to set out the reason that led Debussy to review and revise the prosody of the six songs that comprise Pierrot Lunaire, songs whose texts are well known, of course, from the well-known melodrama by Arnold Schoenberg. It is all but impossible to find a biography. If you can have some, the light, I think, is, is I, too. I've asked um, colleagues if they can check the lights in the situation. Yes, because it's, uh, we see nothing. So I think it uh, is all but impossible to find a bi biography of Geza Vilmos Sagan. It's almost nowhere to be found, not in the New Grove Dictionary, not in the music in Geschichte und Gegenwart. The biographical elements that follow are taken from the above mentioned article by Boga Klaiyes. Zagan belonged to the circle of the composer around Bela Bartok and Zoltan Kodai, with both of whom he maintained a correspondence. He was born in Budapest in 1889 under the name of Wilmot Zerkovich in a family, family of German-speaking Jewish shopkeepers. He changed his name to Zagon in 1909 at the Budapest Academy of Music in his first year with Hans Kessler and his second with Victor Herzfeld. In the spring of 1910, he traveled for the first time to Paris. In 1911, the Roja Volci Publishing House put out his Opus One, a triptych for piano and title uh, poem, which, with individual title in French, Idylle, Dans les Faunes, and Elegy. Pieces will be performed after the lecture by Matthew Lowe. The reviewer of the Revue Musicale scene took note of them in the issue of December 1912, wondering aloud where such music might possibly come from Hungary, I quote, if I am to believe this astonishing vigor and this chickly bold structure and harmonies, end quote. 
This is as it may, this poem demonstrates both Zagan's Edigan Francophilia, Francophilia, and as well as his knowledge of French. It is no doubt for this reason that he had determined to travel to Paris, where he remained from 1912 to 1914, thanks in part to a two year fellowship he had received at the winner, as the winner of the Jubilee Prize of the Crony of Franz Joseph. In Paris, Zagan became an active participant of the musical life of the day, joining the brand new Société Musicale Indépendante and giving here, on 22 May 1913, the first performance of this two movement sonata for piano in D flat, D flat major. And this is a cover of this sonata. This sonata will be performed by after you after the lecture. The critic for Le Monde Musical found this work marked by Debussyism. It was published by the Roger Vergy film in 1914. A few months later, in the same society's concert series, Zagon gave the French premiere of his Pierre Rollinaire, to which I shall return below. Finally, between January and March 1914, Zagon acted as pianist for the lecture series given by Michel Dimitri Calvocoresi on the subject of contemporary music in Europe. According to the critic of the revue musical scene, the pianist play, I quote, with all of the highly prized worthy enthusiasm of the young Hungarian school to which he belonged, end quote, adding in particular that his playing of Bartok and Kodai was marked by, end quote, absolutely understanding, end quote. As proof of Zagan's solid standing in France, we also note that in 1913, the publisher Albert Zunzmato, who was the secretary of the Société Musicale Indépendante, wrote out Jeu de Vague, a piece for piano solo that, as the revue musical scene pointed out, could not have carried a more debussy like title. Uh, it was something to be added, I quote, to the repertory of aquatic music and to the music of the School of Ravel. And we will listen to this piece by Maya Stratigou after the lecture. Not satisfied with being merely a fine pianist and a promising composer, Zagon became as well a quite remarkable music critic. Only a few days before Debussy's arrival in Hungary, the journal The Nekoslimi published on 1st December 1910 a new issue entirely devoted to Debussy. As Jukeli Fashikas and Fries has seen in an article on Debussy reception in Hungary, this journal was the house organ of Roger Volgi publishers, who were of course responsible for Debussy coming to Budapest in the first place. Along with a brief study of Peleas from the pen of Emil Lichtenberg, the journal included four, four further articles, all by Zagan. The third is the Soru analysis of the quartet, which was performed on 5 December 1910. The fourth is a review of that concert. Oh. What's that? Uh, <laughs> I think it's a bit stronger. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> the first is a review of that concept. The second article consists of a detailed description of the work. Yeah. Detailed description of the, of the works. Uh, sorry, I'm lost. I'm, some, I'm somewhere. Uh, of the works of Debussy, opening with the first section devoted to the orchestral works, from the March Ecossais to the three images for orchestra, of which at that time only Iberia and Rome de Printemps had been performed and published in December 1910. The second section is devoted to the works for piano up to the brief book of Prelude, to the first book of Prelude, which Jean had just recently published in April 1910. After a brief paragraph on chamber music, the article concludes with a section on the vocal music with the first part on works for voice and piano, which does not include the Trois de François Villon, published in September 1910, and a second part on works for voice and orchestra that includes L'Enfant Prodigue and La Dame Elle Elu, and concludes with a mention of the three dramas on which WBC was at work at the time, the Histoire de Tristan, which according to Zagan, it would be interesting to compare with the music drama by Wagner, and La, The House of the Fall Usher, and The Devil on, in the Belfry, based on the story of Edgar Allan Poe, the latter two works said here to be intended for performance at the Metropolitan Opera of New York. 
This second article then provides ample evidence of Zagon's profound knowledge of almost all of the Debussy's work. It is clear that he must have made a study of them during his first stay in Paris during the spring of 1910. The special issue of uh, Zenosh Kozlony opened with seven uh, page article entitled, here we are, Claude Debussy. As regularly Fasheka's and precise emphasizes, this article represents a highly penetrating interpretation of the art and aesthetic of Debussy. Indeed, Zagon's texts on 1910 demonstrate a knowledge and understanding of the composer that go far beyond those of most of his contemporaries, with the exception of Paul Duca. Expressing disdain for conservatism in art and praise for the exceptional personality of Alfred Bruno, Zagon traces the trajectory of Debussy's career with particular regard for the, the then current movements of Impressionism and Japonism. I quote uh, Zagon. All of Debussy's works are imprinted with an intense and all encompassing atmosphere out of, which, out of which they are developed, as good coming into view from behind the veil, a panoply of short motif, splashes of color sometimes chiseled, sometimes fluid, sometimes both together. Only in exceptional cases can we speak of anything like thematic development in the traditional sense of the term. Atmosphere is the overmastering element of this music. End quote. Zagon then adaptively analyzes Debussy's use of title, showing how these are by no means and in themselves. I quote Zagon. Debussy's goal is never to have this music serve as an unequivocal interpreter of some sort of program. He wishes rather to reflect upon and to communicate the impression that might be inherent in that program. Whatever the program might be that serves as a basis for his writing, the end of the result will always be homogeneous and several of pure aesthetic abstraction, in which one will find throughout an accepted acceptance of inevitable choices and a rejection of elements that are superfluous and unimportant. End quote. Furthermore, on the subject of the so-called lack of form that supposedly marked much of Debussy's output, the young Hungarian composer remarked, I quote, because of the impressionistic nature of his music, we rarely find structure in the traditional sense of the word. In his shortest pieces, we can detect two part or three part forms resulting from the recurrence of certain motifs or certain interdependent analogous passages. It is furthermore admirable that even in his more complex works, in which not such articulation are present, the proportions are so perfect that the whole seems to be the result of an inner necessity of a pure and absolute aesthetic principle." End quote. Zagan even proposes an astonishing comparison of Debussy and Picasso, proof that he has, in, he has seen the works of of the Spanish master in Paris at a time when they were far from enjoying the celebrity they are today. I quote Zagon. To those who, after hearing this explanation, still remain perplexed by a work of Debussy's, I should like to propose an experiment. Go and look at a painting by Picasso, not be confused with Pissarro. The angularity of his figures represents not a malformation, but rather a kind of immobilization an immobilization with the expressive value of a split second in time, a momentary reflection of his emotion, an emotion that is so inaccessible and so secreted that it cannot be revealed by more externalized means. Most of these works of Debussy that seem mysterious are analogous in this artistic process." End quote. Finally, with reference to Debussy's musical language properly speaking, Dagon suggests that his harmonic system is entirely personal and different from everything else. I quote. Debussy does not take into account the rule of harmony in the classical sense of the word. In his music, what is in charge is a freedom that is absolute, a freedom, however, that is never provocative of disorder, a freedom that is always strictly governed by logic and aesthetics. Indeed, Debussy has created what one might wish to officially to designate as the harmony of freedom. End quote. As for Debussy's dissonance, threatening, Zagon is quite precise. I quote. The dissonances never seem harsh to the ear, and when they are resolved, their apparent severity only heightens the warmth and the sweetness of their resolution. 
What is more, the PC sometimes uses dissonances as consonances. In his hands, dissonance becomes capable of suggesting culture and conclusion. End quote. Even if uh, Debussy never read this text, he must have known something of his content through the intermediacy of Gustave Barthi, who had presumably commissioned the article for this special number of the journal. And he must have been touched by the young Hungarian composer's enthusiasm for and perspective views on, of his music. It is surely for this reason, primarily, that he accepted to go through the six songs of Zagon Kiruliner and to offer to help him to correct the prosody, which, no matter how much of the francophone and francophile Zagon may have been, did need correction. It should also be added that Debussy himself knew and apparently esteemed the poetry of Albert Giraud. Indeed, that he did not set in of it himself is a matter to which we shall return, and directly at the end of this lecture. As we know from the, his indication on the autograph manuscript, Zagan worked on this cycle of six songs on Pierre Rollinaire between October 1908 and September 1909, when he was still a student at the Budapest Academy of Music, and thus well before Arnold Schoenberg began work of his own melodrama in 1912. The first question we need to ask is how Zagan came to know Albert Giraud's collection of poems. Did he first read uh, them in the translation of Otto Erich Achleben, the translation that uh, Schoenberg used, and that had been published in Berlin in 1993, perhaps. But it is nonetheless determined to see that then on the French version, not the version published by, uh, in August 1884 uh, by Le Maire, the publisher of the Persian poets, and in particular of Berlin's Fred Gallant, but rather the version published in 1908 by Fischbacher under the title of Hero and Pierrot, a volume that includes two other cycles by Giraud, Les Dernières Fêtes and Pierrot Narcisse. For this second edition, Albert Giraud not only removed mention of the Rondelle d'Agamas, which are found in the Le Maire edition, but also made a certain number of modifications to the remaining poems. Two of these changes he made for the edition of 1898 appear in Zagon setting. Albert Giraud, 1916, uh, yes, uh, 1816 and 1912, is in fact the pseudonym of Albert Kajemberg, a pianist, lawyer, journalist, and a writer who published some ten collections of poetry that range from Pierre Lunaire of 1884 to the Concert dans le Musée from 1921. Were it not for Schoenberg's celebration composition, Giraud's name would be now surely have faded into total obscurity. He was an active contributor to La Jeune Belgique, a journal devoted to the work of young poets of the time, among them Maurice Metterling, George Rodenbach, and Emile Verhaeren, and he was himself by no means an emblematic figure of the decadence of the era, as Christian Berg has put it. I quote Berg. He was rather emblematic of an entire generation, in particular that of La Jeune Belgique, that wished to create a literature of trompe l'oeil or optical illusion in order to function for several years as an ironic simulacrum of the utilitarian and nationalistic passions that at the time still dominated Belgian literary and artistical circles." Unquote. His Pierre brings together 50 rondelles a 13th century poetic form that attained its apogee in the work of Charles d'Orléans in the 15th century, a form that Théodore de Bonville in particular returned to favor in the third book of the, his Cariatide in 1842 and his rondel of 1875, a poetic form, in other words, that had no yet again come into fashion. In the program note that accompanied the Parisian premiere of Zagon Pierre in December 1913, uh, at the Société Musicale Indépendante, the composer explained the structure of all the verses. I quote Zagan, All of these poems fall into the same form, one that is in fact essentially musical. Each poem is comprised of 13 lines grouped into a stanzas of four, four and five lines, as you can see on the screen. The seventh and Eighth line, Je rêve pour un théâtre de chambre, dont Bruegel peindrait les volets, always correspond to the first and second 
and the 13th, je rêve un théâtre de chambre, always correspond to the first. The refrain thus played a role that was at once rhythmic and musical. Another aspect of the formal structure of the rondelle concerns the rhyme of the two quatrines and the quintet. The first quatrine bears closing rhymes as follows A, B, B, A, and the third quatrine, to which one added a line to form, to form a quintet, to A, B, B, A. While the second quatrine bears interlaced rhymes A, B, A, B. The structure thus turns upon two rhymes, one feminine, one masculine. It is therefore obvious that the poetry poses to the composer a particular kind of challenge. In fact, Albert Giraud, fiercely hostile to anamorphous free verse poetry, chose furthermore to compose his entire collection in of only autosyllabic lines, thereby following the most classical model possible. From Giraud's 50 Rondel Bergamas, Zagon selected six, while Arnold Schoenberg would select 21. The only poems that both composers set are Mess Rouge, Route Messe, and Départ de Pierrot, I'm Fart. Zagon showed the first poem of the collection, Théâtre, the 15th being the 29th, Mess Rouge, the 41st, Poussière Rose, and the 49th, L'Escalier, and to close the cycle, the 36th, Départ de Pierrot. With the exception of the final song, then he followed Giro's ordering, which Schoenberg most certainly did not. In Le Guide du Concert of December 1930, Zagon described the atmosphere created by Giro's poem, I quote Zagon. They are rather reminiscent of Verlaine's Les Fêtes Galantes in the term of the ideas and emotion that motivate their poetic personages, tender and passionate, masked upon whom are reflected souls like that of Schumann. At that time, however, these are just so many sumptuously painted images that evaporate in the pale blue of one's dream. The piano is not constrained to a simple accompaniment. It plays a role that is both independent and important." End quote. As Paolo Boudini notes in his study of the Rondelle d'Albert Giraud, I quote Boudini, the Rondelle of Pierre Linaire, while evoking Parnassian rigor by means of the perfection of their form, Overlook neither the melancholy atmosphere of the Fleur du Mal nor the morbid elegance of the Fête Galande. It is nonetheless the case that this fondel, this miniature tableau, their bejeweled enamels, maintain today all of the fragrance and the freshness of their era. End quote. The autograph manuscript of Pierre Rollinaire, which the BC revision was never brought to publication during Zagon's lifetime, despite the interest in it was. In, that was expressed in June 1914 by the Parisian publisher Albert Dunsmato. It has come down to us thanks to the purchase by the Tsetsheni National Library in 1942 of the papers and manuscript of Zagan's brother, the composer Sander Zerkovic. The manuscript is encased in an orange paper cover on which Zagan set down the title of the work as well as the title of the rondelle he has set to music. It encompasses 12 folios of music, of which a verso of five remain blank. Each song is preceded by an anthemous title page. Yes, for example, the title page of, of Spleen. Uh, with the name of the, of the poem, and at the bottom, in blue pencil, the date of the, date of the composition, 29 January 1909. This leads to the following chronology. Théâtre, uh, uh, 15 October 1908, Spleen, 29 January 1909, Mess Rouge, 26 February 1909, Poussière Rose, 4, uh, 4, March, uh, 4 March 1909, L'Escalier, 1st April 1909, and Départ de Pierrot, 10 September 1909. The music is noted in Black King, fills 30 pages. On 11 of these, we find correction in the end of Claude Debussy, generally above the stay. So you see this page of speed, and there is correction by the DC here, just above the, and yes, just there, this one, and this one, in the handwriting by the DC. Attached to this manuscript is uh, another autograph, 
This is one composed of four folios, uh, like what's wrapped in an orange old, uh, in an orange paper of a Mac and Zagon arm, with the title of the cycle including the vocal parts of four, four songs, four of the six songs. Théâtre, Spleen, Messe Rouge, and Départ de Pierrot. You see a théâtre, only the vocal part. A comparison of the separate vocal parts and the voice uh, piano manuscript shows that the former do not include the correction made by Debussy, and that except for the Départ de Pierrot, there are notably different forms from the original that I have no time to comment. On January 1911, Debussy returned to Zagon the voice and piano manuscript that he had received at some point between 7 and 19 December 1910. It accompanied it with a letter explaining the nature of the correction that he had made. The letter opened as follows. I quote Debussy. Cher Monsieur, along with this letter, you will receive the score of your Pierre Linaire with the correction I felt it necessary to make almost all of which, in the fact, concern the prosodic accent." End quote. Now it happens that the question of the prosodic accents has been an object of study since the 18th century and has resulted in a variety of definitions, some simple, some complex. Briefly, prosodic accents refer to the highlighting of bringing to the fore of a few syllables that lie at the heart of a poetic line. As Brigny point out, I quote, the orthosyllabic line of Pierre Lunaire Although quite varied in their rhythmic uh, schemes, very often emphasizes two tonic syllables, the second and the fifth, which are added to emphasis upon the eighth and the final syllable. End quote. It is not difficult to understand why Zagon was befuddled by the problem of prosodic accent. The pieces correction in this regard are extremely precise. Let us examine each, each of them song by song. So, we begin with the first theater, which Zagan described in Le Guide de Concert of December 1913, I quote, as a kind of prologue that sets out the location of the events to take place and presents some of the personages of the Mimo drama, end quote. The busy correction occurs at the end of the piece, in bar 20, 23 and 24, and then in bar 26. In bar 23, Zagon had placed the word le on a strong beat, um, something which, considering the accent of the line, on verrait les crispales, which fall on the fourth and eighth syllable, uh, it's uh, in red, you know, on the screen for the accent, uh, was in fact not wrong, although this uh, rhythm, as we have just seen, uh, was not the most common one for the octosyllabic line. The changes proposed by the BC had the advantage of avoiding too much weight on the syllable pa of crispin, with a quarter note E flat and an eight note D on Le, of lightening the first bar of bar 26 by means of an eighth note rest, and of highlighting the opening of the following line by elongating the syllab syllable wa of wate. He furthermore facilitates the comprehension of the end of the first line, crispin Le, which is rather complicated when one does not have the text before one's eyes. As for the bass 26, where the rhythm of the line is pour Colombine qui se cambre, is identical to the preceding line, Zagon had perfectly placed the positive accent on the B of Colombine, Colombine and of the camp of the camp. The pieces thus have no need to modify the rhythm, but he did change the pitches in order to underline the importance of these syllables. A dotted eighth E rather than a dotted eighth G natural in the first case, and an F natural rather than a C natural in the second case, something that breaks the conjunct and gently chromatic motion set out by Zagon and replaces it with a more expressive interval of the fifth. So I propose we listen to those bars in the two versions sung by Sasia Eck and David Jones. We are still, for each example, we begin with a Zagon version and then after with the VC version and listen very carefully uh, to this difference in and you see it's uh, uh, very interesting how WC changed the prosody. And thank you so much for doing a lovely report. <laughs>
examining the second one, spin. Piero from Bergamo is bored. Why the song of the rain batter of the windows touches the commentary of the young Hungarian musician in the Guide du Concert on the second song of the cycle Spleen. The biggest correction here concerns the refrain of this rondel Pierrot de Bergam sans nuit, which appears as it's traditional uh, as it is traditional at the first, seventh and thirteenth. First, seventh, thirteenth, fine. Seventh also. Musically, the vocal part um, a structure on the same notes. You can see what the BC did here. And he made some correction for each time. He was making the same correction except for the beginning of the difference. Um, with Rick Pimar, while the piano part is alike upon the first two appearances of the refrain, but different upon the third. In this particular case, the BC does not modify the pitch B and E, but each time he removes the note A, you can see here. For the syllable, sans of sans nuit, which, along with the interval of the major third, sets in relief the end of the line. By contrast, he modifies the rhythm of the line of spleen that reproduces the most frequent rhythm of the alcoholic verse which accent upon the second, fifth, and eighth syllable, in this case upon the row of Piero, the Ga of Bergam, and the Nuit of Sans Nuit. Dagon emphasizes this syllable with a dotted quarter note for the row of Piero, and half note and um, two, uh, qu two notes for the Ga of Bergam, two quarter note for, for the Ga of Bergam. The BC will avoid an overly long extension of the line in the opening bar by having the voice begin in the middle of bar 2 instead of, of upbeat to bar 1, something that avoids placing the syllable row on the first beat of bar 2. He will also modify the pitches for Bergam, a particularly evocative name in his imagination, as we shall see below. Zagon has systematically set the two syllables de Bergam to a descending fix to B to E which has the disadvantage of accentuating the first syllable of Ber, the Bergam, rather than the second, the Ga, the Bergam. The same changes were made in bar 13, 15, 25, 26. Finally, the BC indicated to Zagon in bar 26 that the final E of Sanui must remain, must remain mute, as the Hungarian composer had located the word on his first two appearances. I propose we listen to the first example, bar 1 to 3, of this uh, Pierrot de Bergam sans nuit by uh, Sassia Eck and uh, David Chauvin. ceremony in which he holds uh, up his heart to the terrified face fool in his bloody fingers. Right. That's a commentary of Dagon in the Guide du Concert. With the piano concluding in a violent sounding of church bells. The melancholy Pierrot of Spleen does give way to the highly macabre Pierrot of his song. Here the BC made only a few changes in bar 22, 23 and 26. In the first instance, um, he corrected the gesture in order to avoid the note E for the word da and changed the rhythm of, uh, yes, Dagon, you see, uh, to three quarter notes, which renders more comprehensible the beginning of the line A d'un grand geste, and removed the uselessly strong accent on the syllable gest of jest. In bar 26, the BC avoided the failing, uh, failing major second of curve and eliminated the H rest in order to preserve the verb of this line, which represents the culmination of the most chilling rondel. I propose we listen to uh, these two examples by Sasia Eck and David Jones.
This appears in the rondel at the second and eighth line, as one would expect, and with the expected accentuation, as you can see on the screen, this one. Thus, the BC has an eight threads at bar five. Yes. Here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Providing a welcome breeze between the two lines and avoiding strengths on. Uh, the first beat of the bar and, and clarify also the, the verses, the, it's clearer. Furthermore, by removing the melisma of dan, dan, danse, uh, which has already been acquired by dint of his elision on to the following syllable, the PC avoids the prosodic accent uh, on the same first syllable. This small change enhances the airiness of the expression that Sagan seems to have wished to achieve. To achieve. The PC's second correction in Paulsier Rose. Uh, 2324. Um, Zagan apparently attempted to evoke the atmosphere of dancing, said the Dreu of Cassandre, Dreu of Cassandre here, and the Mo of Morose, um, two, 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 two sixteen notes, as he did for the Ze of Morose, you know. The Bussy modified that rhythm, removed the pattern of uh, the um, quarter note followed by two sixteen, and added an eighth note, F natural, here. Uh, to the drew of Cassandre and emphasize, emphasize the final syllable rose of morose. Um, with an ace dot replacing the two sixteen. In the following bar, Dagon applies a prosodic accent on fal of falbala by means of an ace note rather than on the la of falbala, that is, on the fifth syllable of the line. The psy corrected the passage by reversing the rhythm from the eighth followed by two sixteen to two sixteen followed by the S. I propose with the, the two examples uh, of Poussière Rose by Michaela Wagner and Betty Jones. The, two, the first one. <laughs> Is an evocation of Piero's devotion to Columbine, as Agon puts in Le Guide du Concert. 
The PC corrected for 12, uh, 13, 16, and 22, 23. As in the previous song that we hear, to modify the poetic accent in order to make it conform to the rhythm of the poetic line. Thus, he corrected the rhythm of the octonavix phrase uh, here. Fait dans sa ronde coutumière, whose accent fall on the fourth uh, and eighth syllable. The do of the ronde in French is mute, in fact, it's too heavily inflected with an eighth note F on the second beat. We say rond, uh, rond de was changed to a 16 note F that is no longer on the beat, something that allows for a smoother connection to the following words of the line. Further smooth, smoothness is achieved by changing to a G zagon E flat for the re of coutumière, something that would create an appropriate inflection on the final. In the bar 16, yeah. Uh, so in the bar 1617, Zagon had conceived a melisma on G of léger and another on the lu of lumière. The PC maintained the latter but removed the former and rather placed it on the de of bar 16, which allowed him to lighten the accent of, on G of léger and to bring to the fore the emphasis on the second syllable of frou frou. And finally, another one. Bar 21 22 were likewise transformed by the BC. The BC changes were necessitated by the positioning of the syllable rière of prière. Because in French we have to, we have to separate the prière, we cannot make like a diagonal down. It's not possible on the first beat. Uh, so, because we need the diaresis and thus the necessity of breaking the syllable into parts. In order to fit the pre of prière into the end of the bar, the BC shortened to an ace knot, the dotted ace knot, here. Dagon uh, has written for Blanche. Furthermore, in the following bar, Dagon quarter knot on the word grand, here, gave the word too much white. The BC fixed matters by adding a melisma on de, uh, here, which allowed him to displace the syllable and to set the word grand to only an eighth note D flat. I propose we listen to this three uh, um, example by Michaela Wagner and David Jones. Hello. song of Zagon Pierrot Lunaire entitled Départ de Pierrot also led Debussy to make an extended commentary in his letter to the composer of the 20 January 1911. I quote Debussy. The music that describes Pierrot's, de de Pierrot's departure seems to me to be less felicitous than did that of the other pieces. To be perfectly honest, it is more lunar than Pierrot. In the poem, there is a kind of animation, a kind of fantasy that is simply not found in your music. It seems to me that you ought to attempt to try to find something better, namely something that would preserve all of the Pierrot moonstruck melancholy, while at the same time surrounding it with lighter, more evanescent reason." End quote. The correction that the BC did uh, make here are rather difficult to read, and for the first time, they concern not only, um, 
not only, sorry, <laughs> uh, the beginning and the, not only the vocal part but also the piano accompaniment. They involved almost uniquely the first two lines of the départ de Pierrot, un rayon de lune est à la rame, un blanc nénuphar, la chaloupe, which following the convention of the rondelle reappears in the seventh and eighth line, and also the beginning of a certain night. What does it mean? A ray of moon is uh, the oar, a white water lily is the rowboat. Debussy modified the piano and voice part in bar one, and only the voice in bar four. Dagon had placed the prosodic accent in, on the first syllable of the, more of the word rayon, rather than on the second, where it belonged, even though the syllable rayon was the third of the line. As Boudini has pointed out regarding the octosyllabic line in Gero's poetry, the tonic accent is sometimes prepared, prepared for the third syllable by being twisted by a weak accent on the first, end quote. Because of the vocal line was originally doubled by piano, Debussy invented a short piano introduction in order to present the first two syllables of the line on the last beat of the bar. Furthermore, he placed, he placed the fifth syllable, the lu of lune, on the third beat, on the bar rather than on the fourth, where Zagon had placed it. Finally, in the second line, he shortened, um, yes, that's Zagon here, and finally, uh, in the second time, he shortened to a delta quarter note the setting of blanc and plunged to a delta quarter note the setting of the last syllable of Nenifar, thus following the classical rhyme of the octosyllabic uh, verse. I propose we listen to the beginning of the uh, Départ de Pierrot uh, by Michaela Wagner and David Jones. that Dagon actually followed the French composer advice. However, we do possess a second of Dr. Art's manuscript of the song Mes Rouge, which is preserved with the papers of Pongratz Cacho uh, in the Tsitsini National Library, and whose format is similar to the Dagon manuscript. Here we see that Dagon did not modify the ending of the songs, as Debussy has suggested, but that he did otherwise accept all the corrections that we have described before. Thanks to this manuscript, then it is possible to conclude that Zagon did indeed transfer to his own score the correction that Debussy had made in the five of the Psalms. This year, as it may, two months later, on 23rd March of March 1911, the cycle received its first performance in the concert hall of Budapest Royal Hotel on a vocal recital given by the Hungarian soprano Roji Macharko. The program featured, along with a Zagon, a work by Imre Balaban, a song by Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, and Rubinstein. On the following day, the critic of Budapesti Irla spoke in his review of influence, which he believed was nefarious that Debussy had exercised upon Zagon. I quote a small extract of the review. To be perfectly honest, we find ourselves thoroughly unable to understand the composition of Zagon, nor are we really able to take them seriously. These and all the others, including his work for piano, which seem to us to be nothing more than slavish imitation of Debussy, amongst others. We did much appreciate his pianistic talent of Zagon as a performer, he is sincerely deserving of high praise. High praise end quote. The second performance of Zagon Pierre Lunaire took place in Paris at the Société Musicale Indépendante on the 17 December 1913 on a varied program that included works by Cécile Simon. Verb, Louis Aubert, and Louis Dumas. The solo singer was supposed to be Hilda Roosevelt, but at the end she was replaced by Madeleine Bonnard, as we learned from a piece 
by the influential critic Amy Guillermo, another an ardent supporter of Zagans, who announced in Comedia that I quote Guillermo, Mademoiselle Madeleine Bonnard, a performer very dear to modern composer, would give us the exquisite performance of Piero Linaire by Wilmosh Zegeza Zagan, a work both unusual and attractive that comes to us from Hungary that antidacts, antidacts the pieces by Schoenberg, which carry the same title, and that will be heard for the first time in France. End quote. The mention of Schoenberg's Piero Linaire, the first full performance of which would take place in Paris, some nine years later, in 16 January 1922, at the Vienna concert with Maria Freund as soloist, is not surprising. Ravel and Schmidt had already thought in 1913 about adding Schoenberg's melodrama performed at the Société Musicale Indépendante, of which it happened that William Maud was a founding member. In his review, published in Comedia on 22 December 1913, William Maud wrote favorably uh, of the reduction, a reaction of Zagan Pierre Linaire. I quote a small extract of this review. This remarkable, lively, and original songs by one of the most brilliant composers of the Young Hungarian School are marked by the refined impressionism and written in an highly seductive style. Zagan has translated the Bergamas charm of Albert Eurovision with a great sensitivity and exceedingly flexible elegance. His work is a revelation met with an impassioned ovation. The audience of the SME had made good progress in the time of Kodak. Had Debussy not at time been on a concert tour in Russia, he would of course have attended the concert. Would it have meant that he was an admirer? It is a difficult matter to measure the nature of Debussy's relationship with Zagan at the time of the latter's stay in Paris in uh, 1912. Nor, unfortunately, do we have any recollection from the Hungarian composer himself concerning his meeting with Debussy because Zagan died prematurely only a few years later. We do, however, have a letter that Emma de Bussy sent to Zagan on 22 March 1914, asking that, the postpone he, that he postpone his meeting with her husband until the following Monday, presumably the 30th, because he was suffering from a grief, something that proved that the two musicians did indeed to continue to see one another. And we do, not, we do, know, we do know there is one existed, a photograph of Debussy which has not yet surfaced, with a French composer dedicated to Zagan. I recognize by way of confusion that one might well believe that Debussy's correction of Zago Piero Linaire were in fact minimal, but they are very clear. Perhaps they nonetheless pro provide evidence of his close and attentive reading of the score, and they demonstrate his highly sensitive awareness of the importance of the prosodic accents of the poetic text that has been understood and internalized. We see here then, and not for the first time, the Debussy attentiveness to poetic form, to the music of poetry. We also see a side of the composer's artistic personality that is not aware on view, his openness to the younger generation, and his willingness to offer assistance to one of its number. Edgar Barrez, who made Debussy acquaintance shortly before Zagan, did report in an interview with Liz Herbo, I quote Barrez, when I met him for the first time, he was at least 40 years old, while I was barely 20. But he always treated me simply as a friend, with no condescension whatsoever." Unquote. This is precisely the way we believe Debussy treated Zagan, who may, in fact, have introduced Debussy to some of the works of Bartok and Kodai. And whose interest in Albert Giraud Pierre Linaire may have reminded the French composer of the tantalizing aroma of his youth, when, as an avid reader of the new books and magazines, he was readily, uh, readily fascinated by the latter's poetic and literary movements. It is quite likely that, as a passionate bibliophile, Debussy possessed a copy of the 1884 Lunaire edition of Pierre Lunaire, or if not that one, perhaps the Fischbacher edition of 1898, as André Schechner specifically suspected in the 1953 article on Variation Schoenberg, whose original title was why did you see not compose Pierre Linaire? And even if Schaffner's criticism on the form of Giraud's collection is rather harsh, it does express agreement with those who believe that Debussy's affection for the term Bergamas, whether it be the title of the suite for the piano of 1890, published in 1905, or the ballet scenario of 1909, Mask and Bergamas, prepared for Sergei Diaghilev, was inspired not by a line from Verlaine's Clairvoyune, que vous charmant Mask et Bergamas, but rather by the rondelle Bergamasque of Giraud's Pierre Linaire. 
What is more, Schaeffner points to the influence of Giraud's collection on certain poems by Jules Lafort, one of the writers whom Debussy cherished the most, even though he did not set his poetry to music. To which claim we add that Debussy had, as early in 1882, given into the charm of the Pierrot in Vogue that Jean de Balassio has stressed in his, in his book Pierrot fin siècle. He had said several of the poems in Theodore de Bonville Cariatide, among them Pierrot in Serena, in which Columbine appears. Also, they are, they are not rondelles, these two poems are both very sweetly structured in the style of the Clément Marot. Finally, Debussy was especially fond of the rondelle of Charles d'Orléans. He set two of these of four poets in piano in 1904 and three for chorus uh, in 1898 and they revised them in uh, uh, 1909. These preferences may further explain why, at the end of 1910, Debussy seems to have been happy to look over carefully the new work, Pierre Lunaire, by the youthful Hungarian composer, Gesardin Rostzagel. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the interpretation of the musical example by David Saskia and Michaela Wagner. fascinating insight into, I suppose, a, a future pupil-student relationship in an educational establishment with many composers in this room is a, a familiar familiar thing, but seems to be a very rare one when it comes to Debussy, so mm. that's an interesting insight. And also into the music of Zagon, who is um, very unfamiliar, mm. and I guess that's because he could die soon. Yep, yes. He was very close from Bach, you can go die, yeah. he was very, very close friend. But you can't hear it in the music, can you? Yeah. Which is it's interesting. You would it, perhaps, it, I don't know, Colin Fear think that you, you might expect more Kadai and, and Bartok to, mm. to be thrown through, where actually mm. the proximity to Debussy yeah. seems quite Maybe strange. Because he has a, uh, an amazingly huge, huge knowledge of Debussy's music. I suppose perhaps he, he, he went um, uh, to uh, Durand shop for exam examining all the score because it's impossible. His article, Hungarian article, is a another view of all the BCD and very precise, very very detailed and uh, so it's uh, and as critic is very interesting. He, he make critics of Beethoven on Beethoven uh, of uh, early music too and uh, I hope that the Hungarian uh, scholar will publish uh, Zagon criticize because I think it's very 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 helpful and very uh, very interesting. Um, do, do you think the, the fascination with, with Debussy on Zagon's part was a, a very unusual thing? Yes, uh, we, have, we have not so many things. That, uh, I know, we know that Debussy was close from Edgar Varese, that's true, uh, Faya also. Uh, but uh, Zagon is, was very exceptional that the first time we had something, Debussy correcting, so perhaps he did it for Faya, perhaps, mm. but uh, we have no proofs. And that, uh, so fascinating to discover that it was really the BC Hans writing on, on the manuscript and uh, so tiny, precise. And I think he spent uh, time to, to, to find the, the good solution sometimes because uh, he would like to, to quite not too much. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not the, uh, the professor saying, uh, no, no, you can. Uh, uh, it's very uh, delicate, I think, mm -hmm. very respectful also of uh, what Sagan did. So interesting, I think. Great. On that note, can we open up for a few questions from people here and, and also from people on Zoom? So I don't know whether we relay them through Larry, who perhaps the questions on Zoom could come in the chat. I don't know what you think, yeah. but... We can try through the speaker system. Can we try? The problem, the okay. So we'll see what happens. So who wants to ask the first question? But what well, could be interesting also to have, to have the, uh, yeah. the opinion of the singers and the... Uh, if you like to speak, uh, you, 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 are, you, are, you, are, you are you are fine. It's okay. Or you can say no. It's, it's, it's enough. But I think uh, we have a small discussion uh, before mm -hmm. your rehearsal, and so you were uh, interesting for you because it's practical for you also to. Yeah, it's, it's funny to do two different versions of the same thing, and definitely the busies like changes. Yes. Any sense 
So any instances where that's not the case where you think, oh, that's a Yes, yes. Um, I, I really like the A flat and then the crest is going into the A of the next mm -hmm. next one. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Example. Thank you. Great. Oh, David, sorry. No, no, it's so no, dark. No, no. It's so dark there. I, I do find like the same thing. Was that on the word curve? Except that he didn't, he, he didn't change uh, the end. Uh, it's a uh, strange. Yeah. So, Michaela, did you have an example of one you preferred in um, one of these? Yeah, it's, it's a fifth movement. The fifth? Um, I think it's the A flat, the A bar. Ah, you said that the A flat of Coutunier? That's a question of, of uh, you know, French philosophy because the on French is mute, uh, that mm -hmm. the main problem. And perhaps uh, I think it, 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 it was, you, you did very well. I think the, the AI I said, oh, that's, that's good, too, also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, not to put a strong accent and, uh, on the root, that, that, that was the purpose, I think, you see. Mais dans sa ronde, euh, dans sa ronde, coutumière. Yeah, you know, uh, the eight, the, it's easy to count it, fait dans sa ronde coutumière. The mière is then, it's mière, in fact. Uh, and the present, probably, the BC decided to change uh, that. <laughs> Any more ideas? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, I think it's always uh, very difficult for people who are not native French speakers to get these things right. But yeah. uh, and I think particularly for a Hungarian. Yeah. Because as I understand it, the nature of the Hungarian language puts the accents from your own first syllables. Mm -hmm. So maybe people here know a little more about this than I do. Mm -hmm. Whereas the French, it's more likely to be the last of group and, and, yeah. the, and the accent will fall on a different, different syllable according to what happens to be the last. Mm -hmm. It's not 
addicted to the work. Yep. And that takes a lot of uh, experience, I think, and, and um, very, very hard, I think, for non-French thinkers to get right. Yes. Yes. Surely because, uh, you, you know, it's, you remember the case of the prière aussi, prière, uh, what Dagon did is impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. But it's not strong, you know. Uh, if prière, uh, where, where is it exactly? How to find it? Uh, yes, it's here. Uh, it's not possible to have prière. <laughs> there, there, it was impossible to sing. It's, uh, it was here. Uh, and it's not to accentuate prière, but you, you need this small articulation uh, between two charises. Uh, it's uh, very important uh, here. Uh, I'm not very fond of the Bussy's Le Deux. Le Deux, je trouve que Le Deux is. Le Deux, bon. I think he tried to find something uh, uh, because he don't want to have an accent of the word of prière. The, the word, it's strange. <laughs> Somebody needed to correct the Bussy. <laughs> Do we have uh, more questions? Anybody on Zoom would like to ask something? Why do you think um, Zagon was, was quite well known in, in, in Hungary? But yes, it's not so well known. It, it's very it's, uh, due to uh, Bogdan Fer in Yesh, uh, who, who did his exhibition on Zagon in Paris, and, uh, and we discover that there is a big, the huge link between Paris and, uh, and Budapest at that time. Many exchanges, many exchanges very interesting exchanges. Mm -hmm. You know, when the VC said that uh, the Valbor Quartet play uh, is. Uh, the BBC Quartet, uh, at the same time, they, they were, he performed for the first time the Bartok Quartet also. So uh, I, I would be very, I would like, uh, um, if you have a dream to listen to the Valbore Quartet playing the BBC Quartet, I think it would be very interesting mm -hmm. too. And, um, but there is link exchanges and uh, many Bartok uh, went to Paris too, Kodai mm -hmm. also, and uh, uh, there is a big, big link there. Yeah. It's in the 1920s, then Bartok is in is quite regularly mm. in in Paris, but but Zagon doesn't seem to be formed in the the, yep. the, the composers he's representing. It's yes, yeah, and he also in the Zagon paper we, we, we discover also uh, um, that he, he tried to, to have a, an opera in French uh, with a, with a, a French poet. So I think that if we can find another archive, uh, it would be very nice. But uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there, there, there was the war and the many things, the uh, Second World War, so it was not so easy. But in France, perhaps uh, somewhere, because he, has, he was linked with a poet, I can't remember his name, and they, they, they apparently they, they were trying to, 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 <laughs> to conceive an opera together. Great, so we, we get the chance to, to hear the uh, recital in very shortly. Um, yes. which is it's very exciting to hear Zagon alongside Bartok and Kadai. And there's a very short um, less than 10 minute break. Um, but we've also, if anybody's interested in getting hold of a copy of um, Denis's book, please let me know with the discount for students and a different one for non-students. Just contact me. And um, I've got seven copies here that have been sent over from, from Germany for, the, for this occasion. So it's, it's very nice. But, um, Thank you. And so thank you much. so much for the musical example. Yeah. yeah. It was so important, you know, because I can uh, speak and you say, oh, yes, okay, very deep man. Interesting. But if you, if, if you didn't listen to that, it means nothing. Mm. Yes, yes, you know, good conversion. Thank you. But <laughs> However, thank you so much to Duny for a, a fascinating talk and to our musicians. Thank you. Thank you. Zoom running, okay? So if you, you can put your screen off for a bit and then come and join us at, at half past, okay? That's, uh, this uh, Pierrot uh, was painted on the first edition of the Le Maire uh, Pierrot Lunaire uh, of 1884.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. We're about to start a, a recital linked to the research forum lecture that we've just had, and it was delivered by Professor Denis Elin, and it, looking at the Hungarian composer Zagon. And the, the exciting bit of um, this concert is that we're going to hear Zagon in the context of two of his much more famous contemporaries. So Denis is going to briefly introduce this concert, put it in context, and just to flag up that we're delighted that students of the RNCM are performing in, the, in this concert. So thank you very much. I'm not going to speak very, very long. It's not very long. So this is document is a, is a Dagon papers in the Sicheni library. And it's a conference he, he gave with um, Calvo Coresi for European music of the time, of contemporary music. There's many conferences with you see from Einstein or Cyril Scott. But and Zagon played some pieces. And the idea of this uh, recital after the lecture is to play all the pieces here. We don't know exactly which piece of Antin by Bartok, published in 1909, Zagon played, but we have some uh, extract on the version of 1909, because Bartok revised them after. The same thing for um, Kodai, pieces for, for piano. There is a revision by Kodai in 1915. So, uh, and that will be the version of a uh, I think 1907, I'm not sure, that, but it's at the same time, particularly. And uh, also sketches by Bartok. And more, uh, more we have added uh, Danse Roumaine also, and the Sonata by Zagon. You, you know, I, I showed the, uh, in two movements, I showed this Sonata. It has been performed also uh, in Paris at the SNE. So that's the program, except uh, Orenstein and Sylvie Scott. Uh, but we have added the six uh, songs of the Pierrot Lunaire. Uh, it's a world premiere in a way for, the, for this century because it's not only performed since uh, 1913, uh, amazingly. And, um, and we have added also Jeux de Vague and, and uh, the poem also for having all, unfortunately, what we have, uh, Zagan, what, what Zagan has published. So thank you so much uh, to uh, Maya Stratigou, Mathieu Leu, uh, Edouard Campbell-Vontry, Sasia Eck and Michaela Wagner and David Jones for the Pierre Lunaire and Arthur Yu and uh, uh, Juan Blasquez Garre for performing all this piece. Thank you very much.
of folk um, of works and also to hear Zagon's music and, and none of us are familiar with that so we're really grateful to all of you who have learned new repertoire for this this event and we're, it's very it's very exciting and it, it means a lot I think um, so thank you very much particularly to to our fantastic students becomes a fellow of the RNCM, so we're looking forward to that ceremony. So thank you very much for introducing us to this repertoire and giving us a fantastic um, lecture today. Thank you. One other person hasn't really been thanked enough, and that is David Jones, who's been the organized so much of the performance of this this concert and the lecture so really grateful to you David for mm. that. 